And, you know, you have people in your family that still doubt you. Like, you need to go get a real job. This ain't going to pay the bills. You know what I went to go do? I went to the streets. That paid me the bills, you know? What's up, y'all? This is Tyler Yahweh, a.k.a. Rager Boy himself. And this is the Life We Chose podcast. And it's all about the past that we chose to take this dream right here to the moon. And I want to see everybody's dreams. I want to hear everybody's dreams. I want to hear everybody's trials and tribulations. I want to hear the story that took you to the place that you are today because this is the life we chose. And every day I always think of the times when I first got dropped off on Venice Beach with a skateboard and a suitcase just to chase this dream right here. Man, we're going to talk about the journey today. And the journey was, uh, it wasn't the, the, the easiest journey in the world. Let's start off from day one, where I'm from. I'm from a small town called Altamont Springs, Florida. It's the outskirts of Orlando. And what we say is no Disney World where I'm from. Because there's a lot of stuff going down from drugs to crime to homelessness to poverty and one thing about that, it brought me who I am today. It made me who I am today. And uh, I'm super proud of it. Like my cousins, my family, everybody came from the hood and we all stuck together and we won together no matter what. And I was the, I was the black sheep out of the family. I was the one who was skateboarding, who was listening to rock music, who was doing things that was n out the norm from where I'm from. And, uh, Coming from this small town called Altamont Springs, it taught me a lot. It taught me how to, what what I say, we, we say this a lot. Me and my cousin, we say it's a bunch of crabs in a bucket. So a lot of people don't want to really see you win. They don't want to see you make it to the top. You will have a dream and they just shoot it down right away. Oh, you got, that's too big. You never going to be an artist. You never going to be a basketball player. You never going to win these Grammys. You never going to be a multi-platinum artist. Look, I, I really did it. I really left where I'm from just to chase this dream right here. And luckily, I had a beautiful mom that always encouraged me to be the best. I had a beautiful sister that encouraged me to be the best and inspired me because my sister, she was in a girl band that was called Diziac. I don't know if y'all know this. It was a small, this is during early 2000s. And watching her go to dance practices, being in the studio, doing shows, it inspired me so much. And it showed that I had the same talent in me. And it was just instilled in us. And uh, it, took me, it took me a lot to really figure out this dream because I thought I was going to be a pro skater. Like, I was skateboarding every single day. I was in the skate park. I was looking up skate, skate videos, trying to teach myself tricks. And then... I finally found music. Music, it was just that one time I'm in a skate park and I heard a rock song. I'm like, who is it? I think it was like Guns N' Roses or it was like a Metallica type of, I don't know which band it was, but it made me go straight home and look it up. And ever since that, I fell in love with music. I fell in love with sounds. I fell in love with the lifestyle of being a rock star. I fell in love with the shows. I fell in love with wanting to be on a tour bus in my life. And seeing all that, it taught me so much today. And I keep, I keep that instilled in me. Like I always go back to that one moment of seeing, seeing Green Day on Fuse TV, listening to the Dookie tape, having my sister get every single Green Day CD that you can find in Best Buy. I used to go to Best Buy just to listen to the music when I didn't even have money. I used to ride my bike to Best Buy. You know how they used to have the little, the headphones? I used to go there and just listen to every CD that I can. Like, dang, I can't wait to get this CD for Christmas. Like, I can't wait to hear this. And that moment right there showed me like, this is your calling, kid. This is what you need to do. Like, you need to figure it out, like, right now. And one day, I remember being in my house. I was writing lyrics all the time in my little comprehension book that I had. And my mom and my stepdad found my lyric book. And that was the most embarrassing thing of my life. I was scared, like, because I had so many curse words in my book. <laughs> I had so many curse words. And I remember when my, my dad and my, my dad and my mom told me to come in the room, they, they, they had my book. I'm like, dang, y'all went through my room, found my book. This is my personal space right there. But in my mom's house, you ain't got no personal space if you ain't paying the bills. Like, it, that doesn't even happen at all. 
So I remember my mom was like, so what's up with all these lyrics of you saying this, F word this, B word this? You know, I can cuss on here, but it's just I'm going to say how they were saying it. And all I can think of was just like, yo, I want to be a musician. They all was like, they all kind of like laughed it off and like, you really want to be a musician? You know what it takes to be a musician? No, I didn't know what it took to be a musician, but I knew I wanted to be it, you know? So I, you know, I'm in middle school now and I was a bad kid. I'm not going to lie. I was very disobedient, always getting in trouble, always getting phone calls home, always getting referrals. Just that I was I was really bad as hell. I'm not even gonna lie. I was that badass kid that was getting in fights. That was I was smoking weed at a young age. That's like crazy. I started smoking weed at like 14, by the way. That's it's insane. Insane. <laughs> Shout out to the marijuana because it brought me here today. And um one thing about that, I remember I was just so bad in school and they just did not give me PE for some reason. Like did Everybody had gym class. Everybody had to go to gym, except for me. All I had was art and chorus class. And I hated chorus. Like, I, I didn't want to do nothing in chorus, I swear. And one day, shout out to Miss Longoria. I always shout her out in my interviews. But one day, I'm like singing. I was like singing a song out loud, like not really under, like noticing that I was singing. I was just singing a song that was stuck in my head. And I, I guess I had an amazing voice. Miss Longoria one day was like, yo, front singer, you, you're a lead singer today. I'm like, what you mean I'm lead singer? I'm not singing. Like every day until I, like she would not let me lead the class until I sung. And I finally sung it. We had a like a, a school concert going on and I had that lead part and everybody was in wow. They were like, whoa, you can actually sing. And then I seen all the pretty girls and everybody like, well, they were kind of on me. They were like, yo, you can sing, sing on the bus for us, this and that. And that's when I noticed I, I had a talent. I had a talent that was impeccable, that was groundbreaking. And um, I used it, you know, I started singing more. I started dancing more. I started actually getting into my creative mode, not just skateboarding. I started using my talents more and more and more. And being that person, it just taught me so much within myself that you can do anything. Like when my mom says, you can do anything through Christ that strengthens you. And I kept that and I held on to that every single day. So I started learning that I can make music and I'm writing a lot. I know I can sing. And it was only my, my friend in my neighborhood, he had like a little studio behind his shed. He had like a little shed that he made. Like it was first a smoking little section Then he brought his studio equipment in there. Really shitty quality like equipment. It wasn't the best equipment in the world, to be honest. Uh, it was, I think we was recording off like Mixmaster or something with a little blues mic that you can usb blues mic you can get from best buy once again and um i made my first song and it was so ass i didn't know how to, i didn't know what i was doing i didn't know where it was going I, I had lyrics all over the place that didn't even make sense i didn't really know how to structure a song the right way and um that hearing my friends tell me the song was ass made me want to go harder like all right, let me just get this going. And I had a best friend who was my next door neighbor. Shout out to Kevin, still my dog. Um, Kevin started producing on Fruity Loops. So he started giving me beats. And the beats weren't all the best beats in the world, but we was using them, you know? You got a homie that's producing music right next door. You can just walk down the street and go, go to his room and he's producing. And I started writing my lyrics down. I'm like spitting them out. We both trying to get the best verses. Then we go, we wait to get to school to show everybody our verses. That's what we do. Like we went, we went hard. Like we couldn't wait to get to the freestyle circle because it's like, yo, I, I got a, a fire 16 to give everybody, which is y'all should know what a 16 bars are. And it, it, it just taught me something. Like I knew, I wanted to be this for real. Like I just kept going harder and harder and harder. And I seen all my other friends kind of falling back from the dream of trying to make music, but I kept going. Nothing ever stopped me. And then I remember my ninth grade year, um, I went to a school called Lake Howell High School. And I was already kind of in the streets. I was already 
you know, dibbling and dabbling back and forth and just hustling and showing myself that I, I had to make money somehow, you know. we I didn't have a job, so I had to figure out how to get new clothes. I had to figure out, like, my mom wasn't just going to give it to me. Sometimes she spoiled me, but she wanted me to really work for it. So I went to the streets, you know, and I, I had to... I had to hustle to get studio time, like figure out how to get studio time. Shout out to my dog Precise because I used to ride my bike all the way to Alton. Like I used to live in a place called Castleberry, and Altamont's probably like ten minute, five minutes from Castleberry, ten minutes from Ca Castleberry. So I ride my bike all the way to Precise's crib, which he had a dope professional studio that he built in his house. And one day I made my first real song, and it was called Joe Fraser. I don't know if y'all can find that. If you find that, you a genius. You a real deal genius if you find that song. And Joe Frazier was the start of it all, you know? This is when Hulk Share was going on. When you put your music on Hulk Share, people had to download all your music. LimeWire days. This is way back before you kids had Apple streaming and Spotify and YouTube pretty much. And made Joe Frazier. And then the response that I got from people, they was really liking it. I'm like, yo. I finally found my sound. I finally found I found the the formula to this music shit, you know? Like it was so hard to really get the bars right and get metaphors right and get the story right. And I finally figured it out. And then that was the the that was the championship ring for me right then and there. And after I made Joe Frazier, I made another song called Alone. And Alone did so good. It did amazing. My whole school, it got over like 10,000 downloads on Hulkshare. And then it had so many, like, it had so many downloads. I was just spamming it on everybody's MySpace, Facebook. I was messaging people, asking them, what do you think about this song? How do you, how you respond to this song? And people was just, everybody in my school was loving the song. And... That was the moment I was like, all right, I got something in my hands. This is like, this is something that is not, I didn't even expect it to be. I didn't even think my music was going to be that good for other people. And when I made Alone, we finally, I, I shot my own music video with one of my homies who was a videographer at the time. I'm in ninth grade finding out all this, like. I'm in the studio every night. I'm finding my sound. We, I'm finding people that do videographer work. Didn't even know, like, no kid in high school even can find that. But I, I was the one to find it. Made alone and uh, we shot the video. And I had this idea to put the radio station, which was 102 Jams. I put, no, it was 95.3, actually. I put the radio station's number at the end of the music video, and I told everybody to call it every single day. No matter, I will send the YouTube link with the number, call this right now. I'll go to my friend's phone, call this right now. I'll go to school in the morning, make sure everybody I see call and request the song alone. And... One day, we, like, me and my boy, he drove me up to 95.3, and he was like, bro, let's see if they going to, like, respond to you. We went up to 95.3. I showed them the music video. They were like, so you're the kid that keep getting these spam phone calls about alone, and we couldn't even find this song. Like, and then we finally found who you are, and they finally put the song on the radio, and I was like, whoa. I'm, like, 15 years I'm like, I'm like, 14 years old in ninth grade like i have a song on the radio this is unbelievable this is in my hometown people are like yo you about to make it i'm getting all these good affirmations from people that didn't even really mess with me they didn't fuck with me at all because i was the black sheep no matter what i was hanging out with older people didn't really hang out with the kids in school i was always on the streets doing what i had to do and seeing that response that was the moment i was like you know what this is what I want to do. This is this is my dream. Like I'm going to stick with this. And you know, you have people in your family that still doubt you like you need to go get a real job. This ain't going to pay the bills. You know what I went to go do? I went to the streets. That paid me the bills, you know? And that paid for my studio time. That paid for my looks. That paid for my videos. That paid for the CDs that I was selling and I was sending out to people. I will go out all over Orlando from the Altamont Mall to the to UCF area, which is a college area, just 
to sing to people and get a donation from my CDs, even if it was a dollar, if it was two dollars, if it was five dollars. Sometimes I'll just give it to, sing to it, give it to them, and be like, "Listen to it. Follow me on Facebook. Go listen to the song on YouTube." And that's where I started off, knowing that I knew how to guerrilla market. I know how to market myself. I know how to put myself in a position to win. So going through those trials and tribulations, you know, I wasn't the best in school. I was hanging out with the wrong crowds, you know. Still my homies, though. I don't, you know, we ride for our homies no matter what. Those still my dogs, my ride or die dogs, no matter what. But we were doing some, we were doing some hood rat shit, you know. We was doing things that we weren't supposed to do, selling drugs. I was still in cars, doing things that I wasn't supposed to be doing. I had to, I had to hustle, and then one day I'm home, you know, like I was, I was barely going to school, like I was skipping school so much. I was just go to the studio, I would hustle all night, go to the studio, and then go to school, and probably leave school probably like the third period, second period. Have one of my friends pick me up, or I had, I had, I used to drop a car off down the street that, you know, don't ask how I got that car, but. I used to have a car, I parked down the street, and after like lunch, I'll just leave and just like never go back to school. And one day I, I knew I had to go to school because we have a thing called truancy. And you don't want your truancy, if you miss a certain amount of days in school, your parents will go to jail, they will get arrested. So whatever I did to prevent my mom to even know that or get arrested, I, I went to school. Even though I wasn't doing nothing in school, I was just sleeping. I had money, so it would, nobody can tell me nothing at all. Like, you could not tell me anything. And uh, I remember being in, it was like Algebra two class or something. It was like fourth period or something. And I was just so, I, I came to school late, and I just walked on campus and went to class, and I went straight to sleep. And I had a bunch of cash just fall out of my pocket. And everybody just started getting hype, like, yo, damn, you got all that cash. Oh, and the teacher came to me, he's like, um, I'm going to have to confiscate that. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> what are you talking about? He's like, if you don't, con if I, if you don't give me the money, you're going to have to go, like, go to the front office. I grabbed my cheese, and I walked straight off to campus. Then I went to school the next day. And kid you, and mind you, I'm actually on probation at this time, I skipped a lot of stories because the journey is crazy and I didn't want to give you all that. But I'm on probation for a little weed charge that I got locked up for. I was selling weed, you know, I had to get that money. And I'm on pro I'm in probation and they, they called me on the intercom in school. Tyler, can you come to the principal's office? And they didn't, they could have just called on the on the phone, but nah, they called me on the the whole school. And like everybody can hear that in the school. Like everybody. I'm like, man, what is this about today? I walk in, it's literally, literally my mom, my stepdad, which my dad, I call him my dad, and my probation officer and the principal and the, the assistant principal all sitting in, in the class. They're like, Tyler, you're never going to be nothing if you're going to keep doing this and keep acting like this. You don't apply yourself in school. You're a bad influence on all the kids in school. I looked at them. I kept saying, bro. I was like, bro, what are y'all talking about? And they was like, we're not your bro. We're grown adults. Stop calling us a bro. I remember this to this day. I'm like, bro, like, I don't know why y'all over here, like, coming at me. I'm still coming to school no matter what. My probation, probation officer is like, well, you're going to have, they're, they're expelling you today. So you're getting kicked out of school and you have to go to continuation school, which is a place called Journeys. I'm like, damn it. I got to go to this. Ba it's literally the bad kid school. Like we're all the bad. It literally had metal detectors when you walk in. You had metal detectors. You had to wear a suit and tie. You had to wear a, a button up with a tie and dress shoes and khaki pants, which I hated. I hated that to the fullest. That wasn't in the stilo at all. So what I used to do, I used to go to H&M and get the full button up suit and say, fuck it, I'm about to, if I'm going to look fly today, I'm going to look fly in the right way with my, I had the Oxfords on, the the full little pen suit, skinny suit, looking fly at all with the, I used to unbutton my, you know, I keep my shit unbuttoned. You see how fly I am today. Check out the outfit though. Check out the shoes. You see the shoes. Yes. Yes. But more of the story, I had to go to continuation school and then we get to, well, I'm going to continuation school and then one day my mom, I'm in the house and my mom walks in my room and she caught me counting money 
she's like, what do you do it? I'm just chilling. And she like goes in my room and she finds my, my stash. She finds my stash. I had some weed in there, had a couple other things that, you know, it was very incriminating. Me and my mom kind of get in a little scruffle. A, I'm like 15 at this time. Getting a little scruffle. She's trying to, t she's trying to flush all my weed down the toilet. And I'm like, you're not doing it. This is money, hard work money that, sorry, mom, I love you. I had to tell this story. You, you remember this day. You gonna, I know you're going to watch this and laugh. But we got in a little scruffle. She was trying to beat me up. I would not let go of my money. I wouldn't let go of my weed. Would not let it go. And she was like, I'm going to call the police on you. I'm like, you going to call the police on your son? On your son? Your, your, your son you going to call the police on? And she's like, well, it, it's either that or you get out my house. And I'm like, all right, I'm gone. Like, that's, I'm out of here. I've been waiting for this day, you know? So that's when I became, I wasn't homeless at first because I had homies that was letting me sleep on their couch at first. But I ended up, I had bread, so I got an apartment at the age of 15. Like, I found a, a buddy, what we call, to get, like, put, his, put the house under his name. I made sure the bills was paid. And I still went to continuation school. There was a bus right next to the, the house. We had to take the bus. You couldn't take a car to continuation school. You had to take the bus there. So I'm on probation, got to go to school. It's in requirement. Still got to do checkups, but I'm kicked out the house. And I'm like, I'm on my own at this point. And I'm still trying to pursue this music career. I'm still trying to figure out, like, what, what, is, what, is, what am I going to do in my life? Like, I'm only 15. I ain't got nowhere to, like nowhere to really I don't have a real family around me so I got the streets that's all I had and I have the studio that's all I had was this music and the day I got off of probation I don't know how I passed probation because I was smoking weed every single day no matter what I was going to school smelling like weed I was smoking before I went to school I was smoking after I got out of school you know, rolled up, right? I was rolling up on the bus. That's how bad I was. Like, I was that bad of a kid. And God, sorry for all the problems I put <laughs> my parents through. <laughs> I love y'all. They love me now. Thank you, God. Thank you so much. But, um, yeah, like, I'm kicked out. I'm trying to figure out this, this dream, this music dream. And I'm still in the streets trying to get away from the streets. It's either you're going to jail or you're going to get robbed or you're gonna go to you're gonna go to jail or you're gonna be dead it's either or pick which one you want pick which route you want to go with and then I picked this music route like I kept going with this music I never stopped and we ended up being in a I ended up finding a collective group of kids that are all like-minded like me that all wanted to chase this dream that all stayed in the studio we had videographers we had producers we had, we were all fly. We were all, we were all about, we were all reckless. We all like, we all hustled a little bit on the side just to support our dreams. And uh, we, they, we started opening up for all these different acts. I'm probably like 16 at this time now. Going to, I'm open, I'm going to clubs. I'm going to, I'm walking in clubs that you're, I'm not even, I don't even have an ID. And I'm performing at all these little open, like open mics. I'm performing in strip clubs. I'm performing in these places a 16 year old shouldn't be at. But we made it happen every single day. And um, yeah, like I started opening up for all these different artists. Shout out to my homies who own a huge festival called Rolling Loud, Tark, Tark, and Matt Zingler. They helped us out so much by putting us in the position to win, to be honest, because they were still in the process of losing money, too. And they're, so they're off of shows and booking artists from like Rick, Wa Rick Ross to French Montana to Juicy J to ASAP Rockies to the ASAP Ferks to... G Easy's. I could name so many artists that we opened up for that before they even became who they are today. And we got to see their journeys and we were a part of those journeys. And 
it was just such a blessing having them in our corner because they never gave up on us and they helped us build this fan base, this organic, natural, or it was a, we call it underground. You know, this is the underground, the real underground. This is where the mosh pits come in. This is where the crowd surfing came in. This is where like the dirty vans and high waisted shorts, like people, all that came in. Like bare, we was bare. It was times we were probably taking no showers. We were just being rock stars for real. Like it was, it was kind of, it was kind of disgusting. I'm not gonna lie. It was moments where we were like, dog, we were some dirty ass kids. No lie. But that was the lifestyle, you know, that was just the motivation. And it was just, su it was such a thrill. It was such a, it was just that, it, that was that one thing that we were just, we couldn't let go and we knew it was going to take over the world one day. And we all kind of separated, started doing our own own thing because some people started getting locked up for a ve very long time. Some people are not here with us no more. And shout out to all the people that are still here with the journey and they're still part of the process too. Watching Roland, like watching, it started off with Dopey and T and like we were going from Tampa, we were going to, or doing a show in Orlando, doing a show in Tampa, do a show in Miami every weekend, every weekend going back and forth on the road, opening up for all these different acts. And that's where the fan base started coming in. That's where the SoundCloud era started coming in. That's where, the XXXs and the Little Pumps and the Wi-Fi Funerals and the Puyas, Denzel Curry's, Rob Banks, Danny Towers. Um, I can keep going on for all the kids that are that did it, you know, that really showed showed from the ground up, and you can still check them out today, and they're massive, you know. That's where we started off from, and today, like watching Rolling Loud. Like, I literally remember waking up in Tark's apartment, and he had a two-bedroom apartment with his wife and kid. Now he has two kids. I think three kids now. But I remember waking up and seeing Rolling Loud on the whiteboard, like the first festival which they had in Miami, which was a flop, I guess. It, was, it got rained out. Every, it was a flood. It was a lot of crazy things, uh, crazy events that happened that day. I think Schoolboy Q opened up for that. He was like the headliner. Juicy J was a, a headliner. And that was the beginning of this whole era of the journey that we're choosing today. This is the life that we chose to get to this point. And being being in that position of life showed me so much of how to hustle, how to control a crowd, how to start a fan base, how to how to be yourself on the stage no matter what. Creating a fan base was one thing that was very like a big thing on me, having a real support system and really gr like giving all my fans gratitude and going to people after shows, taking pictures, even though like it was probably a couple hundred people in the crowd, I would still go and take pictures with everybody. I'll, it, was, it was times I'll have a game of skate, which is skateboarding. It's like horse and skateboarding and um, playing game of skates after the show with people, hang, having a drink with everybody, just really just like getting all that, getting like collecting all those energies from different people is what taught me to be the artist today because I really was in the field. I was really out here like touching, kissing babies, getting like just giving the love back to everybody that showed me love when I was on that stage. I made sure I gave them all that gratitude. And today is amazing because now I look back at all that. I'm a multi-platinum artist. I been around the world. I probably performed in front of a million people already in my life. And seeing different cultures, seeing different crowds, seeing people cry, being in that journey from coming from that small town out to Mont Springs, Florida, show me so much that I'm strong. I can do whatever I want in life and nothing can ever stop me. I remember times where I'm on the computer and like, yeah, like I'm just 
I didn't have a job or anything, but I was on the computer just marketing, networking, making sure something happened, sending my music to everybody, making sure they listen to it, like putting the groundwork in. And my uncle came in one day, shout out to Uncle Frank. I told him about this the other day. He's like, man, what you doing? Like, what, what are you going to do with your life? This is what you want to do? You want to just try to be an artist? I'm like, yes. I'm going to be that artist. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to be the biggest artist in the world. Watch. And look, he's super proud. He's like, yo, you showed me wrong because you never gave up. And I'm showing that to all my family, my friends, anybody out here in the world that they just give up, you know, just don't give up on yourself. No matter what you go through, just don't give up because that one moment is a chance that can make your whole world change and change for the better, change for the good. And you're going to be able to be that person to motivate just like me, motivating other children, other kids, other grownups that never believed in their dream that still have this dream today. You over here, you over here. See, my girlfriend is over here. My my wifey over here trying. She over here, you know, Natasha Grazi. Wait, oh, I just said her name wrong. You remember when you did that to me the first time we was on the podcast? Yeah, uh, Natasha Graziano. There you go. Oh, we got Natasha Graziano on the show now. And she eating. This is a ratchet podcast today. <laughs> nah, do your thing, baby. You can sit down and be my first co guest, my co host, you know, my guest on the show. What's up, Natasha Graziano? What you eating? So what does the life we chose mean to you? We decide our movie. We choose our character. We write our script every day. We decide who do you want to be? Like you want to show up as yourself or you want to play your old self? Do you want to live in the past or do you want to choose your future? This is the life we chose. So what was the thing that you chose that took you to that point in life before anything? Like don't like just as a kid, like waking up in the morning, getting your, going to school, like what was the, what, what did you choose? What was that first dream that you ever wanted in your life? I was young. I was really young. I think I was like 10 years old and I just wanted to dance. I just wanted to perform. And I would go to school and know I've got my dance classes after school. And that was what I was choosing. Like I hated school. <laughs> I knew I was going to get through it because I had dance after. Like I knew I was just going to get through the day and get to my dance class. Get through the day, get to my performance. Get through the day, get to my acting. That's where my dream began. You know, knowing that I could do something and express my creativity, express myself. Mm -hmm. And I hated school. I was bullied at school. You was bullied? Yeah, you didn't know that, baby? Mm -mm. Oh my God. Yeah, what, yeah, what was I was doing? Like how was they bullying you? Well, it was really horrendous. They made me feel like I was, because I looked different, right? I went to school in a real white people area and I looked different to everybody else. I was like more tan, more different, wore different clothes. Obviously where I'm from, like originally I had a different nose. So I just got bullied like fucking great. Which is a beautiful nose. Thank you, baby. But no, it didn't start like that. So I just was made to feel like it was not worthy i was not worthy and i remember feeling depressed for most of my life i had a girl who would pull my hair every time i walked past my locker and she this girl like just was so vindictive she was a nasty piece of work and she made me leave the school it's actually crazy because we come from two different places i'm from florida and you're from a, a place called oxford oxford uk, UK. and bullying where we from we don't really take bullying like it's no such thing as a bully. It's either you getting picked on, you better hold your ground. You better, you getting in a fight that day. Every single day you're going to get in a fight. If you get it, if somebody picking up, there's still a form of bullying because people, we have a thing called roasting where they crack jokes on you. <laughs> then we have the people that just are just, they just wake up with a vengeance, just want to just pick on people like, oh, you're ugly or this person's ugly it's because of all the things they go through mm -hmm. in their childhood, their childhood home, whatever their parents were doing to them to come out and say, oh, I got to go pick on this person today. I got to go do that. But where we from, we didn't take that. We get we get straight to the knuckles. We knuckling and buckling like right after the bus. Yo, we got to go see me. All that smack you was talking. You got nah, get that out of here. We you need to see me outside. Wow. So, so it's it's crazy to see that people like from your your time they have bullies and stuff. Totally right? different, completely different. It was just like an environment where it was like you know you you either were 
not bullied or you were a bully. And it was just like one of the two. And I was always really popular in school, but it came with like, it's like a double-edged sword. So like you were like the coolest girl, but you were also like the most hated. Mm -hmm. Cause whenever you're on a platform and it's the same in life, whenever you're on a platform, you can be the most loved person, but you're gonna have a fucking, it's the yin and the yang. You're gonna have the opposite, right? Polarities. So you're always gonna have people that hate you. you gotta reverse that polarity. <laughs> polarity. Yeah, for reverse sure. Reverse that polarity. So people polarity. are gonna have it. And I truly believe if you're not, if you don't have haters, like you're not fucking doing anything. You're not loved.